Okay, so now we just talk through this section a little bit about the kind of the, the perceptions and the reality, the difference between these in, in terms of Icelandic volcanism. In general, then, you can expect an ash cloud about every two decades. So that's on average. And in terms of where this calculation has come from, you can go through the Icelandic historical records and you can find out how many times we've had an eruption. And you can go to the soil and you can go up the soil here and you can find the ash there, so there they all are. And you can count those and if you have carbon dates somewhere along that, then you can work out when they were as well. And so you can say that on average, we'll get a volcanic eruption in Iceland about once every five years. In terms of what comes out, again, most of uh, Iceland's volcanoes are basalt, so you wouldn't expect them to be explosive. But then on the other hand, there's lots of water around, there's lots of glaciers around, so maybe that will make them explode. And if you work out what's happened in the past, then about three quarters of them turn out to be explosive. And then the other factor you have to take into account is the wind direction. So this map up here is from a Met Office study where they've worked out an average wind direction over lots and lots of time for the average position of, a, of an ash cloud. And you can see that in general, they're going to go towards the east. And within a couple of days, then they should be reaching Scandinavia. But in terms of getting down to the UK, then the chances of them hitting the UK are about one in three. So if you take all those numbers, one every five years, three quarters explosive um, coming to the UK about a third of the time, then it means you'd expect an ash cloud about once every two decades on average. You might hear people talking, saying that um, Icelandic volcanoes are becoming increasingly active. And this sounds quite dramatic, and it is definitely true, but it's kind of just getting a bit more active. And so this study, where this actually came from, was a more detailed study around Grimsvot. So Grimsvot and Barthabunga and all of the volcanoes around the Vatna Jökull ice cap. And the researchers took samples from within the ice cap where you can actually get the ash layers within the ice. And that gave them a really detailed um, measurement of how often the eruptions are happening. And what they find is they find that there's a kind of cycle. So you can see this scale here is eruptions per 40 years. So basically, um, this is one eruption a decade, two eruptions a decade. Um, but you can see that there's a kind of cycle. It's got a periodicity of about 230 years. And so when people say Iceland's volcanoes are getting more active, it's because um, we were down in the lull during the 19th and 20th centuries, and now it looks like we're, we're working our way back up. So this means that we might get more eruptions, but again, we're going from one eruption per decade to two eruptions per decade. So it's not like it's going to be erupting all the time. It's just a, a slight bit of a difference. One of the things that this also ties into is um, times when there's rifting going on. And importantly, these two stars are the times of big fissure eruptions, which we'll talk about um, later on. But the fissure eruptions seem to coincide with the peaks in the activity and the peaks in the rifting that people have found out. So that's definitely true. Iceland's volcanoes are getting slightly more active. The other thing we heard a lot about during the Eyjafjallajökull eruption was Eyjafjallajökull's big bad sister, Katla, and how mean she was and how she was going to have really great big eruptions. And it's certainly true that Katla can have big eruptions. So here is the, um, is the eruption from 1918. And you can see the plume that it produced there. But actually, that eruption was not much bigger than the Grimsvot eruption. And if you go through the historical record and you look and actually, 16 of the past 20 eruptions from Katla have been similar to or smaller than the Grimsvot eruption. So it's most likely, if we have another Katla eruption, it's going to be similar to or smaller than the Grimsvot eruption. And we know now with the new flight rules that a Grimsvot eruption doesn't necessarily mean destruction for all of Europe. So, so that's an important fact to, to take into account. There's also this idea that maybe it erupts in time with um, Eyjafjallajökull, and well, Eyjafjallajökull erupted in 1823, and then we had this little flood that came out of Katla in 2011, so this picture here is of a bridge that got destroyed then. But, but all of these things here, these are um, seismicity and little floods. They don't count as proper eruptions in the same way as 19 and stuff. But when you look at them, you can see the kind of pattern, and you'd expect a couple of eruptions a century. So this is why people say we're waiting for Katla to come. It, it could erupt soon. And if you live in Iceland, then a Katla eruption is quite serious. A Grimsvot eruption is quite serious. Um, Grimsvot didn't bother anyone because it's in the middle of this ice cap. But if you imagine the area that got completely blanketed with Tefra, Katla is in the south of Iceland, which is in inhabited areas near farmland. And so you could imagine if all that Tefra was getting put onto farmland, then that's a pretty nasty situation. So Katla is a serious volcano if you live in Iceland. Also has another hazard, which is a Jökulaup. So Jökulaup is the Icelandic word means glacier leap. And it basically is a meltwater flood. So when you have an eruption under the ice, then all the water comes cascading out. 
and the yolk allowance from Katla um, can be huge. If you look up here, we've got a picture of the Amazon basin. The, uh, the flow there in the Amazon is about 250,000 cubic meters per second. The estimated flow from the Katla 1918 yolk allowance was 300,000 cubic meters per second. So if you imagine all of that water coming, cascading out of Katla over these different areas and carrying with it these huge icebergs, then you can see that um, a Katla eruption is obviously a very serious prospect if you live in Iceland. But just because something is a serious prospect if you live in Iceland um, doesn't mean that it's necessarily doom and gloom for us over in the UK. And so um, it's definitely important that you that when you hear about eruptions and you hear that something's going to happen, then you don't automatically assume that it's going to be the worst case scenario. And that brings me on to this. Um, so here we've got a headline. This was about a month ago. Icelandic volcano Hekla is starting to bulge with magma and make fears of a major eruption which could happen within days and could hit air travel. And so this is an example of the, the kind of thing that often is, in, is the common perception of these eruptions. Now, you guys are all geography teachers, so it's your job to make sure that the public understands the world around them. That, that is your job. That is not the Daily Mail's job. The one sole purpose of the Daily Mail's website is to generate clicks. That's their only job. And unfortunately, the way that they can do that is using um, fear mongering and hype and everything like that. And that's not unfortunate to them, but, uh, but that's how it is. And unfortunately, they're also very good at it. So that story, within a couple of days, has been shared five and a half thousand times. Now, I'd love to get five and a half thousand views for a blog post that I wrote, never mind that many shares, and yet they can get this repeatedly just by always going to the worst case scenario and always saying, oh, it's terrible, it's all going to be really bad. But the thing that's kind of interesting about this is this story had to come from somewhere, and there is a grain or a kernel of truth in this if you dig down through all the different layers. So this idea that, ha that Hecla could erupt any day or that a Hecla eruption could just happen is kind of true. Um, Hecla eruptions tend to give us very little warning. So if you think of lots of volcanoes, particularly ones in, in island arcs and places like that, then you get lots of earthquakes as the volcano is getting ready to erupt. Hecla's not like that. This is an example using data from the Icelandic Met Office of um, prior to the eruption that it had in the year 2000. And this is showing strain. So this is um, equipment that they've got in boreholes that can detect deformation in the rock. And you can see that basically as we come up to the eruption, 547, nothing going on. 617, the volcano is in eruption. So you've got half an hour's warning, basically. There's also some earthquakes you can see here. This is what we've got here. But they're only magnitudes two, so you wouldn't even notice them. You could be walking on the crest of Hecla, and you wouldn't even notice it. The first warning that you'd have that was going to erupt would be when ash started coming out in front of you. And so this was something that the Icelanders were trying to remind people. The Icelandic police put out a thing saying, Look, you shouldn't really go up Hecla, but if you're going to, then leave some of your mobile phone number. And that was what the Daily Mail picked up on, and that was what they used, and that's what they put out in as their, their article. Um, the other thing is that it could kind of erupt. It is ready to go. People are waiting for Hecla to erupt. If you look at when the eruptions were in the past, 1947, 1970, 18, 91, and 2000, then Hecla is, is as you say, it's kind of it's ready to go. You would think with this pattern, then it should have gone already. And there's other evidence for this apart from this simple timeline. In between eruptions, what you find is that Hecla tends to expand. So it inflates up with magma, and then during the eruption, it drops back down. Inflates up and drops back down. This diagram here is showing you um, measurements of that that have been made by satellite. And so you can see since 1991, it's inflated up, drops back down, inflates up, and drops back down. And so actually, since about 2006, the level of inflation has been bigger than it was when it erupted in 91 and 2000. And so on that respect, then people are just waiting for Hecla to go. It, it could just erupt. Um, on the other hand, each of these eruptions um, from 1970 onwards was actually um, relatively small. So you had uh, an explosive opening phase, you had ash coming out for a few hours, and then it switched, and then it produced lava for a few weeks after that. So, so even if it did erupt, and even if that did happen, the most likely scenario is going to be similar to Grimsel, where you get disruption maybe for a day or two, and mainly in northern Europe, Scandinavia, somewhere like that. 
Other thing you often hear, again, particularly with Katla, is that maybe it's going to erupt and it's going to be so huge and it's going to plunge us all into a global volcanic winter. And that's not really realistic in terms of these eruptions either. It is possible volcanoes can affect global climate. And in fact, they're very important um, effects in global climate. The way in which they do this is with the gases that they produce when they erupt. So what happens is you have an eruption, it puts sulfur dioxide up into the stratosphere. Up there it reacts and it turns into sulfuric acid aerosols, which are little particles. And these little particles reflect the sunlight away and that's what cools the earth down. And because they're up there in the stratosphere, then they're above the weather. So they don't get rained out and they can drift around and they can stay up there for years. So it's really, it really is important and it really is possible for volcanoes to modify the climate. This diagram here um, is from the IPCC's last report, the 2007 one. And what we've got is the yellow are modeled runs of global climate. The um, black is what actually happened. And you can see it's pretty spiky, but you can see that there are spikes for a number of eruptions there. The thing that's really important to notice about this is these volcanoes, Santa Maria, Agung, El Chichon, and Pinatubo, these volcanoes are all located in the tropics. And so one thing that can happen, and one thing that makes a big difference in terms of the climate impact of an eruption, is if you have a volcano erupts and puts the sulfur dioxide in the tropics, Generally, atmospheric patterns tend to move stuff from the equator towards the poles. So if you put stuff out in the tropics, it can go all the way up to a whole hemisphere. And if it's near the equator, it can maybe cover both hemispheres. And that lets it make a big impact. Whereas Iceland is basically most of the way towards the North Pole anyway. So if the gas comes out there, it tends to get trapped in the northern part and it doesn't have so much effect. So yes, it's true that volcanoes can affect global climate, but it's not so likely that, um, that these Icelandic eruptions are going to do that. If you want any idea, if you've got any doubt of the effect that humans are having on climate, this bottom graph here, all of these blue lines, are what happens if you take out mankind's activity. So you can see that what we're doing here is much more than any one of these volcanoes can do or have done by themselves.